So the Starship Troopers video I'm working on, it's like it's about my perspective on the movie as both someone who grew up in the cultures that Robert Heinlein was raised in and the culture that um, Paul Verhoeven was raised in. Okay. And I want to talk about it as like how these two different people could see the same work differently. Like okay. Like Heinlein and uh, Verhoeven. Fair warning to viewers. What follows is not necessarily criticism or theory, but autobiography. You have an assignment. I ended my interviews with my family by giving them an assignment. An assignment that I will also give you, the viewer. Listen to my dream and interpret it. I remember this dream vividly because it was performed in Mr. Cunningham's freshman year um, theater class. Uh, describe a dream, have the other students act it out, you can, so you can ask him about it. Um, the dream is this. I don't recall exactly where I was, but I felt like I was moving somewhere. It was a place of transport, a train station, or an airport. I don't recall where I was going, but I had the feeling that I was being moved around by other people. I remember being handed a picture of myself with relevant information, like a, like a passport or a, some kind of ID. I didn't like the way that I looked. I appeared filthier, dirtier. My hair was long and scraggly. I looked evil somehow. The one specific detail I remember was that my mouth was filled with cigarette butts. My mouth was filled with cigarette butts. And none of the information on my passport was correct. Not my name, not my birth date. It looked like I had been faked. I wondered who faked it and why. I remember sitting down and noticing a suitcase. The suitcase was ticking. Realizing what was about to happen, I bolted upright, but it was too late. The bomb went off. And the white flash of the explosion overtook me. I awoke in a panic. We don't need a book-accurate film adaptation of Starship Troopers. You see, the shape of culture is a mass of roots growing into each other, not a collection of individual artifacts preserved under glass unaffected by each other. Starship Troopers was a popular book, winning the Hugo Award, and remember, was on official US government reading lists. Even if we didn't get an adaptation that focused on the cool power armor, as many, many comments in the last videos have said, the ideas behind the book lived on and seeped into the larger popular culture in different forms. Given the limitations of 1997 CGI, practical armor and CG aliens seems like the best use of resources. Easier to render masses of non-humans than detailed photoreal humanoids and the big machines they fight in. If the production did focus on the armor, it might have felt even more like a Saturday morning cartoon. The computing power in VFX craft to render the kind of detailed, multifaceted power armor that Heinlein dreamt of was still about a decade away. We don't need a movie focusing on cool power armor, especially because we've been overwhelmed by a franchise based on that very thing for the last decade and a half. You've seen Iron Man, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, which one? Uh, uh, the first one. Yeah. I have read uh, fan readings of that scene. They were terrified by a scene in which Iron Man flies to Afghanistan, lands in a terrorist camp. There's a scene where he looks up, points his gun at a group of people, targets go on their faces to look out for threats, and he shoots only the threats. Yeah. I guess, how do you determine what that threat is? Well, that, that, that's a tough one. Uh, if I were to design it as an engineer, I would, uh, forgive me, I would probably do it based on facial recognition or pattern recognition. Machine vision linked in with a heads up display, linked in with an artificial intelligence on, on threat assessments, and maybe biased with a human override at the end on, on when he finally decides to commit. But uh, that's, I'm just taking a little flight and perch to Men in Black. Yeah. With the interview scene. I was and thinking of that. Yeah. 
Okay. Where Will... he suits the little girl. Yeah. Okay. May I ask why you felt little Tiffany deserved to die? Well, first I was going to pop this guy hanging from the street light, and then I realized, you know, he's just working out. By the way, the role was originally going to go to Chris O'Donnell, who played Robin in Batman and Robin. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I saw a little Tiffany. I'm thinking, you know, eight-year-old white girl, middle of the ghetto, bunch of monsters, this time of night with quantum physics books. She about to start some shit, Zed. The joke is that a black NYPD officer is making lame excuses for shooting an unarmed white child. Or do I owe her an apology? No, it, it's a funny scene, and but it goes back to your question of how do you assess the threat? <laughs> how do you assess threats? Yeah. And, and what do you consider a, a threat? Because it is, it is contextual, it's cultural, it's biased. And now for no reason at all, I'm going to play a clip from the movie where an MI officer subdues someone by kneeling on their neck until they pass out. Oh my, why ever could I be playing this clip? Yeah. Um, and um, yeah. Men in Black, interestingly enough, came out the same year as Starship Troopers, and it dominated the summer blockbuster season, while Verhoeven's film got pushed back to the very unblockbustery release date of November. So the Zeitgeist embraced this other story about a heavily armed league of men trained to protect the Earth from space aliens. And like Starship Troopers, it's about a naive recruit being trained to join a fighting force under the tutelage of a professional mansplainer. I mean, this line could easily be a Heinlein quote. A person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. Men in Black was my favorite movie when I was 10. I watched the movie on VHS till I wore it out. I watched all the animated series on the WB. I remember that Halloween, I went as Agent K, my best friend at the time, went as Agent J. Oh god, that year at my school's fall talent show. Um, we are the best kept secret in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna play this footage because I have a platform and my elementary school teachers don't. We are the TIB. What does that mean? Teachers in black. So, ma. <laughs> Revenge at last. <laughs> also, if you ignore my teachers doing the worst dance ever and listen closely, you can hear me rapping along, so, um... Proof. I loved this film as a kid. I've watched it more times than I can count. And I will never forget that the first line of the film is... Goddamn bugs. And our introduction to the Men in Black has them taking over a sting operation by Border Patrol at the U.S.-Mexico border, presenting them as a stronger, grander scale mode of enforcing immigration laws. Anywhere near here. And the primary antagonist is a bug. Zed, we have a bug. So, what, we don't like bugs? Bugs thrive on carnage, tiger. They consume, infest, destroy, live off the death and destruction of other species. You were stung as a child, weren't you? And yes, for a film about stopping illegal aliens, it's very funny. Bro, just check in. They don't check out. Anyway, 1997, the year that both Men in Black and Starship Troopers came out, was the last full year of my childhood in America. It was 98, right? Yeah, June 98. You guys finished school on a Friday afternoon, and I think we hopped on the airplane Saturday afternoon. The villain uh, picked us up at uh, the airport on Sunday morning at Skiphole when we got in there. In 1998, my family made that long trip to another world. Another continent, but to me, a kid in the days of dial-up internet, was still a world away. So well, what was... This was, um, say, freshman year. Um, after 2000, after September 11th. It was. Yeah. It was. Do you remember your first reaction when we had come out of the, uh, the airplane at uh, Skiphole and went walking uh, through the airport heading towards passport control? One of the very first things you said to me, it stinks in here. The this cigarettes. is, at that point in time, in 1998, 
when uh, smoking was pervasive throughout Dutch culture, cigarette bans on public uh, places had not been put in place until four, five, six years later. Now, Mom was right. It was definitely a post-9-11 nightmare. Terrorism was on my mind, as it was on everyone's. But while I was telling that story, I couldn't help but think back to another conversation my brother and I had about Dutch insults. Yeah, Dutch cursing is fascinating. Much more heavily reliant on disease and things that you actually would not want to wish on somebody. If you wanted to insult someone in Dutch, what was the worst thing you could say to them? Uh, you know, like krijg kanker or uh, kanker jonge, kanker, kanker meisje, get cancer, or calling somebody a cancer boy, cancer girl. To be fair to the Dutch, there's been a recent pushback against using cancer as an insult, since it's obviously insensitive to people who suffer from cancer. But the art of being disrespectful moves ever forward. I heard an NPR interview earlier this year where uh, the newest insult, the newest insult uh, among, amongst the youngins, krijg de corona. God. Get the corona. So I couldn't find the NPR piece Michael was talking about, but I did find some Dutch language sources that confirm that krijg de corona is actually an insult being used online. I could be completely out of it. I mean, I haven't been back to Holland in seven years. And I guess that's the caveat we have to put on all this. Our family has not lived in the Netherlands since 2016. But both Michael and I graduated from high school there. We both grew up there. And our family set roots there for 18 years. Now my brother and I are both third culture kids. That is, a child... I can't do all these. That is, a child who's grown up partially in different countries at formative stages of their life. Where are you from is a difficult question for any third culture kid to answer. I, like Noe Malone, want to just toss my fries in the air and answer, different places. Let me make this clear. I did not live there as a fun work assignment or as a school project. I'm not Emily in Paris here. I had a whole adolescence and teenage experience there. I became an adult there. It was a home. And as the years have gone by, I can't help but think that that home is under attack. There is a specter haunting Europe. The specter of the Griswolds. National Lampoon's European vacation is the most fucking triggering thing for me. Everyone I knew from America spent every waking moment trying not to seem like those Americans. Big gutted yokels bumbling around tourist attractions, wearing fanny packs, blathering, do you speak English? We're the ambassadors of America here. I mean, are Americans so dumb we can't figure out a roundabout? We know Big Ben. Parliament. I remember like the fights we had in the car, like trying to figure out how to work a roundabout. <laughs> I cannot get left. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Clark Griswold, that idea of, you know, the American family man. Yeah, Chevy Chase, uh, right? Yeah, Chevy Chase. I've rewatched uh, National Lampoon's European Vacation recently, and I realized, oh God, this is what I was afraid of looking like all this time. That character is who I was terrified of becoming all of my life. Yeah. You know, nice. the ugly American. Can I say that's sad? The idea of the ugly American has always been fascinating to me, particularly because the stereotype is rooted in a lack of self-reflection. The American abroad is unused to seeing themselves as outsiders, as another nationality among many. When we first got over there, I remember being told, don't wear white sneakers, because at that time, Americans were the only ones who wore white, what the British would call trainers. To say for a long time, when I moved back to America, I didn't wear shorts ever, because I just, <laughs> people wearing shorts there, Maybe you looked American. Like, what would the American stereotype be? Loud takes up more space. And what I mean by that is just Americans would just have like an outsized an emotional and mental presence. After you're there a long, a long enough time, if you get on the tram and there's someone uh, newly arrived, they, they talk too loud. They're just mm -hmm. too loud. 
And it's not just kids, it's adults too, you know? It's like you could go into a room and spot who the Americans were just by seeing who wasn't trying to blend into the crowd. And hey, Europe, I get it. I am sorry. On behalf of my people, I am sorry. I weep for the poor, good Europeans forced to deal with these New World children. I mean, Americans, how would you feel if a stereotypical Dutch family with all their worst qualities were traipsing around your country? Yes. Yes, feel my pain, Americans. Does the word flubber ring a bell? Yes. Yes, this real movie, a raunchy comedy hit about a lower-class Dutch family sent by a cultural exchange program to New York, is the perfect inverse of National Lampoon's European Vacation. It stars this cigar-chomping human moo-moo, this guy with the worst die job ever, this guy who's perpetually horny, this actress burdened with the thankless character of bre breast, breast, have her, ha have breast, and it's directed by a guy with the unbelievably hilarious name, Dick Mass. It's an utterly bizarre comedy where a lower class Dutch family explores pre-gentrified Manhattan and hijinks ensue. And by hijinks, I mean they kind of do an oopsie doodle 9-11. But then again, so did the Griswolds, I suppose. Anyway, if Clark Griswold was my stereotypical American, this character, played by Hoop Stoppel, Johnny Flodder, was my idea of a stereotypical Dutchman. Dyed blonde hair, corny taste in music, bobbed his head a lot, probably smelled like frit sauce. I always called him Yoast in my head. This guy seems like a Yoast. I actually knew some guys named Yost in high school. If you're listening to this, this is not about you. I I actually never like got to know you that well, and I feel bad about that. So if you're watching this, hi. Amerika is a land of the ongewenste mogelijkheden, denk you? Is it um, any good? Is it funny? Uh... Jongens, als we willen, lopen we allemaal hartstikke binnen. De jongens in de vrije sector, zoals wij, is dit land ideaal. So I guess the joke is that they actually thrive there. Like, they have their own club. <laughs> <laughs> like the first movie is them, you know, being bad neighbors and being disruptive and loud and uh, mm -hmm. obnoxious and raunchy and rude and that sort of thing. And they move to America and like, they're fine. Yeah. <laughs> of course, the fact that they end up in New York um, is interesting given the, the actual history of New York, mm -hmm. being Dutch originally. Mom's right. Even old New York was once New Amsterdam. Typische Wall Street cash. <laughs> Wall Street, the center of American commerce, was so named because it ran along the wall of a fort built by the Dutch. Dutch colonizers also named the district of Brooklyn and the neighborhoods of Vlissingen, Boswijk, Konijn Eiland, Dijker Heights, the Bouwerij, Harlem, and even the U.S. state of Rood Eiland. So many scenes of American life can be illustrated with Dutch words, from the act of the filibuster on the Senate floor, to bickering to your boss about getting another dollar, to kids with their knapsacks playing hooky, to Caribbean pirates shouting avast, all hands on deck, maelstrom off the bow, hoist the mizzen mast or I'll have you keel hauled, to a forlorn bumpkin, quick with a trigger, crooning on the wagon trail, to eloping with some dapper, kinky geek, to leaving out cookies for Santa Claus. All of these scenes would be impossible to describe without Dutch-derived words. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Look at one of the most globally used American epithets. One first used to describe the colonists of New Amsterdam, a first name common to Dutch settlers of the time. Jan Case. Yankee! And I haven't even mentioned the people in America of Dutch descent. Some of the oldest, richest, and most powerful families in America have Dutch last names. Vanderbilt, Roosevelt, and for you Hamilton fans, the Schuylers. American literature would be unrecognizable without Herman Melville, also of Dutch descent. The U.S. and the Netherlands have been allies in some form or another since the U.S. was founded. In 1782, the Dutch Republic was the first country to formally recognize American independence as John Adams worked as an envoy to the Dutch, eventually becoming the first U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands before becoming America's second president. And even before that, in 1620, a group of English Puritans left the city of Leiden, where they had been living in self-imposed exile for the last 13 years. They took a canal ship to Delfshaven in Rotterdam, where they boarded a ship called the Speedwell. 
The Speedwell took them through the English Channel to Plymouth, where they began their last and longest leg of their journey aboard a ship called the Mayflower. So many Americans don't know that the Puritans had a 10-year layover in Leiden. You remember Thanksgiving uh, oh. in Leiden. The Thanksgiving service on American Thanksgiving, they have them in many major European cities where there are a lot of expats. The church in which we held our Thanksgiving services was the church that the Elgin Fathers worshipped at when they lived in Leiden. Right, which I mean, is historic and it is kind of cool when you think about it, but if you go to enough of those services, you hear them every year. <laughs> <laughs> it was England to the Netherlands to escape religious persecution, and they were indeed not persecuted, but the local Dutch society expected them to assimilate. Part of that assimilation was being open to their particular religion as well, and that was even a step too far for the Puritans. They wanted their way exactly the way that they wanted it, and the Dutch were like, no, we, we live too close together in uh, uh, two uh, small confines. Um, you know, those of you who want to stay and assimilate, uh, continue to practice your uh, religion and whatnot, feel free. Uh, the rest mm -hmm. of you, uh, how can we help you get out? <laughs> the historical truth is that Dutch-American relations have always been sunny. And if there are any stereotypes Americans have about the Dutch, if any, besides the whole, you know, thing, is that the Dutch are super nice. Hi. We gave you the shirt because you seemed a bit cold. You speak really good English. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Netherlands. Netherlands. How many times have you been talking to someone in Dutch and they heard an American accent and they switched to English for your convenience? Oh, I would say about 90% of the time, 95% of the time. The Dutch, by the time they graduated from what we would call high school or, or the gymnasium, had to speak Dutch, of course, but they also had to be able to speak English. They had to have one romance language, either French or Spanish. They had to know German, and then they had an elective for a fourth language. So the Dutch, by the time they were 18 years old, were expected to know five languages. There was one guy who, after I'd been there 10 or 15 years, and he'd spent all of his time talking to me in English, turned to me and says, why don't you know more Dutch? Uh, Actually, that's a good question. Why don't you know more Dutch, Dad? I mean, Mom and Dad still don't speak Dutch, even though they were there for 18 years. They both say that this is very much because they were never forced to learn it. I never picked up the language that way. I speak about seven or eight computer languages, but... Yeah. Dit is a big American's pizza. Extra groot, met extra veel topping in jouw hand. The Dutch, generally, like Americans. And Americans, generally, have culturally colonized most of the world to accommodate themselves, so there was plenty of America to cling on to while we were there. We Americans, what can I say? You know, well, we, we brought it with us, you know. Most of the culture shock we had involved things we didn't expect. I went to my intake interview uh, with my new boss, and he goes, Calvin, Calvin, uh, that's a Swedish name, isn't it? And I said, yes, how did you know? And he says, well, I'm Norwegian. Let me tell you about the oppression of Norway for centuries by the Swedish kings. And, <laughs> I, and he was serious. Nonetheless, American stereotypes persist. Have you ever felt othered because you were an American? Oh yeah. Caricature of the American uh, is uh, uh, Jack D. Ripper. Dr. Strangelove. The international communist conspiracy to sap and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. Or uh, George C. Scott, also I think Dr. Strangelove. But I do say no more than 10 to 20 million killed, tops, uh, depending on the breaks. You know, I got made fun of for my weight a lot. Uh, one of the clearest indicators that somebody is not Dutch is being overweight in a particular way, typically having a big belly, big legs. Big Americans, the real big taste. Over the years, I've been told by many Dutch people that I looked American. I usually assumed they were calling me fat. Now that I live on the internet, they call me soy boy, or neckbeard, or 
SJW, or whatever relevant terms are now being used. The in-joke that Americans outside of America used is that we are CWA, Canadian while abroad. And that's more of a joke than an actual defense mechanism. It's not like we're in danger or anything. It's more like we had to be more polite and considerate while abroad. Because to Americans, Canadians are super nice. So be Canadian. Don't act like an ugly American. You've asked me before have I ever pretended to be Canadian while abroad. And uh, uh, yes, I have. And, really? Yeah, and it was after 9-11. Goedemiddag, twee vliegtuigen zijn neergestort op het World Trade Center in I New York. Remember at least one being approached the train geleden. station. Volgens de eerste uh, zijn er somebody asked me if I was American and, and wanting to talk about 9-11. I just said, oh, I just, you know, it's horrible. Well, you know, I, 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 I'm Canadian. I think I said something to the effect, I'm watching it from the outside, much the way you are. I just not want to have that conversation. I did not want to have that conversation. What's more, even though we were Americans going to an American school, that is, it used American grading systems, we were in a truly international community. Even though we did go to an American school, you know, only 40% of the school was American. 30% was Dutch. My 2005 senior yearbook lists everyone not only by name, but by nationality, just as a statement of fact and a point of pride. International Day at school that was just sort of an amalgamation that celebrated all the nationalities at school. Different wings of the school were set up for different continents. The various families set up, you know, f uh, food booths. They would cook traditional food. They would set up little information boards. If they had instruments, they would bring those in. North America had so many representatives from it that we basically took over an entire wing of the school. Then all the American kids were broken down by region of the country. So you had the California uh, folks come dressed in as surfer bros. Uh, we would dress up as politicians because we're from D.C. At our international school, there was a sense of America as just being another nation among a community of nations, and not just as, you know, the world's only superpower. I'll just say this. Model United Nations in The Hague? So intense. So if I can check my privilege, and I have a lot, I had the privilege of constantly having my sense of American exceptionalism challenged, which I'm so grateful for. Right when we um, first moved there, you were talking about something outrageous and um, what kind of good American something would do that, something or other. Mm -hmm. Another kid immediately snapped back, we're not in America, dipshit. <laughs> and I just, and I was shocked that, oh, I, I meant it like, just, I meant American as normal. And I was surprised that I did that. <laughs> You were what, 12? Yeah. I've been instinctively using the word American interchangeably with the word normal. Probably the most recognizable American caricature made in the Netherlands is this. A Nazi anti-American cartoon distributed in the Netherlands during occupation, which compresses a lot of pieces of American culture into a monster ready to destroy European culture that hilariously has the mask of a Ku Klux Klan member threatening the Nazis. Which, sure. And yeah, there's expected anti-Semitism and anti-black caricatures, along with a white woman in indigenous headdress with extra arms representing crime and drumming and the world's most beautiful leg, oh no, just literally threatening us with a good time. Anyway, the chimeric amalgamation is the point. The Nazis are trying to portray America as multicultural and therefore degenerate. Stereotypes conflated to the point of exclusivity. Want to see some inclusive stereotypes? I will have to see if I can find the cartoon that circulates in, in NATO. The perfect NATO member, done by a British cartoonist, was on the wall of his office. A circle of stereotypes listing virtues while depicting caricatures displaying the opposite. Humble as a Frenchman, humorous as a German, generous as a Dutchman. This is the caricature of an American, a square-jawed man shoving a book labeled Rules into a scared man's face. Well, it's it's George Patton, you know. <laughs> it's any number of the scenes of George Patton. You magnificent bastard, I read your book! National stereotypes seem inevitable when comparing two cultures. One can overgeneralize, oversimplify, omit, and conglomerate. 
I have no doubt that I've done so in this essay, both to America and to the Netherlands. Both cultures that I have deep roots in, and both cultures I have big problems with. In Civilization and Its Discontents, Sigmund Freud wrote of this phenomenon. It is clearly not easy for men to give up the satisfaction of this inclination to aggression. They do not feel comfortable without it. The advantage which a comparatively small cultural group offers of allowing this instinct an outlet in the form of hostility against intruders is not to be despised. It is always possible to bind together a considerable number of people in love, so long as there are other people left over to receive the manifestations of their aggressiveness. I once discussed the phenomenon that it is precisely communities with adjoining territories, and related to each other in other ways, as well, who are engaged in constant feuds and ridiculing each other. Like the Spaniards and Portuguese, for instance, the North Germans and South Germans, the English and Scotch, and so on. I'll tell you, because I grew up in Holland, I knew so many jokes about the Germans. Oh, me and my family love jokes about the Germans. In fact, when interviewing my mom and dad, they both made the same joke about the Germans independently. When we were traveling, well, it must have been somewhere where German was on the television. That was hilarious and dead <laughs> on to personality type to see Dallas and J.R. Ewing in German. Oh, Barnes, du wirst wirklich von Tag zu Tag dümmer. <laughs> Pinky in the brain in German. Genau dasselbe wie jeden Abend, Pinky. Wir versuchen die Welt herrschaften und zu reißen. Somehow the brain in German worked. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> The joke being that the German language sounds inherently authoritarian. A joke based on, you know, real history, but a joke nonetheless. Freud continues, I gave this phenomenon the name of the narcissism of minor differences, a name which does not do much to explain it. We can now see that it is a convenient and relatively harmless satisfaction of the inclination to aggression, by means of which cohesion between the members of a community is made easier. In this respect, the Jewish people, scattered everywhere, have rendered most useful services to the civilizations of the countries that have been their hosts. But unfortunately, all the massacres of the Jews in the Middle Ages did not suffice to make that period more peaceful and secure for their Christian fellows. Let's not euphemize. The narcissism of minor differences is often prelude to violence. And on the internet, where we live, Minor differences pile up. We mute certain words, auto-block certain suspicious accounts, use hashtags and trending topics to distinguish ourselves from what we are and are not. The internet is organized through tactical use of signaling friend or foe. And I do this too. I can't recall how many times I've been accused of doing what the right calls virtue signaling. Now let's talk about my Twitter habits. Follow me on Twitter. Oh boy, do you know where this is going. The 45th President of the United States, Donald John Trump, is a fascist. I am completely sure of this fact. You will not sway me from disbelieving this fact. So sure am I of this fact that I spent every day of 2018 tweeting a variation on the phrase, Death to Fascism. I wanted everyone to know where I stood. I wanted to signal to those people who looked at Trump and his followers and saw how obvious his fascism was. Because he was so obviously fascist. How could everyone else not see that? Was it because his speeches weren't in German? It was certainly obvious to the Germans. Look at these covers from when he was inaugurated. And being on Twitter and repeatedly saying death to fascism was useful for me. Because in my personal experience, anti-fascists, which is most people, would respond with, yeah, fuck fascism. The fascist would respond with some disavowal, some variant of, you can't prove that, name one thing, come on, the word fascism is meaningless because people use it. <laughs> fascism is marked by denial. In 2019, I tongue-in-cheekily started a video series that I called Cinema Antifa. Matter of fact, Cinema Antifa, in earlier drafts, was the working title for this very video essay. I only made two videos, and the release of those videos happened to coincide with a few violent clashes in Portland, instigated by a group calling themselves the Proud Boys, which was then followed by several attempts by American officials to designate Antifa as a terrorist organization, despite there being no such organization. And here I was, putting a target on myself. 
Also, I was getting a lot of weird comments about some dipshit getting hit with a milkshake and whining about it. I made those videos unlisted for my safety and for my sanity, but I'll give the links to anyone who asks. As for why I did it, I guess I was trying to educate. I was also trying to provoke. Mostly I was trying to figure out who was on my side. What I realize now is that I wasn't just saying death to fascism and go Antifa. <clears throat> I was saying shibboleth. The Book of Judges, Chapter 12. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so that when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said nay, then they said unto him, Say now, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him, and slew him at the passages of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. Those biblical tribes are making tactical use of a natural trait of language acquisition. The older a person gets, the harder it is to learn new phonemes. It's why the longer an immigrant family stays in a country, you'll find that the older generations will have thicker accents. Remember how my family pronounced Schreveningen? Schreveningen. 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 The name of the beach, which was... You're really gonna make me do it again. <laughs> <laughs> There's a scene in Soldier of Orange where the Dutch army stops our heroes and has them pronounce Schreveningen. To make sure they aren't German spies. That is not uh, a Paul Verhoeven thing. That is a historical fact from World War II. Schreveningen is a shibboleth for the Dutch language, and the Dutch resistance would root out suspected German spies by telling suspected Germans to say Schreveningen. And if they couldn't do it, then. Um, I think the Americans, the shibboleth they used in World War II was Lollapalooza when fighting <laughs> in the Pacific. <laughs> which, oh, um, oh no. Oh no. Yeah. The function of a shibboleth is simple. Determine who is in the group and who is out of the group. And yes, in times of war, it can mean the difference between life and death. For Americans, our shibboleth might be that hard R sound. We even add it where it doesn't belong. I lived on base at Lejeune, Camp Le well, excuse me, Camp Lejeune, as we are now instructed to call it. I should tell you a story. I should tell you a story. After graduating from my high school in The Hague, I went to college in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is where I left from as well. Maryland is a former slave state, and like the greater Washington, D.C. region, Prince George's County has a high African-American population both in the sense of descendants of the enslaved and new immigrants from Africa. In particular, the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia and Eritrea. I was backstage in the University of Maryland. We were preparing for a show. I tried to say the name of the beach where my family stayed when we first came there, where we partied on the weekends, where we had our prom. Schreveningen. Nope, you're still adding the R. I was trying to like pronounce it correctly. I was saying it over and over again. Schreveningen, Schreveningen, Schreveningen. Think about the sound. A black student said, it sounds like you're saying... I will not repeat the phrase that he thought I was saying, but I will encourage the viewer to consider every possible connotation of the phrase saying it with the hard R. <sighs> okay. Yeah, I guess Which is completely not the etymology of the word, although... <laughs> yeah. Of course, of course, yeah. but, yeah, you're not, just... but you're not thinking about the etymology of the word, you're thinking about the sound. You hear this person say something, wait, is he saying that? Like, right. what the hell does that sound like? I'd say uniquely American shibboleth, isn't it? That American R. I've never heard it that way, so I just, my reaction is, what? <laughs> seriously, I just. I guess if you're constantly looking out for the sounds that people are making, like what words are they saying? Like, what is the shibboleth? What, how do I know that this person is a threat to me? When will they say Shraveningen? 
or let's <laughs> let's, let, let's go back to threat analysis and risk in that but threat analysis one of the big problems you have in any kind of uh, uh, technical threat assessment system or signal identification system is is built-in bias if you're looking for something you may see it when it's not really there I'm, I'm not trying to minimize what, what you're what your uh, castmate was, was saying. No, I'm they, saying I totally understand why he would hear that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, and 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 they, they they live a life where they have to worry about that sort of thing. But I mean, I've, I've never heard I've never heard it that way. That's the thing about enemies. They have to be created, described. People like computers need to be taught friend from foe. They need reasons to hate signs to dislike. They need a taxonomy of features to differentiate us from them. And for the manufactured enemies themselves, they can become very wary of how they are described. Umberto Eco, now oversighted on the internet as a career anti-fascist, should be instead cited for his work in semiotics, the study of signs and symbols. His field was not simply the study of what symbols mean, but in how that meaning is created and reinforced. I like reading Echo a lot, and it's important to understand him beyond that one set of definitions of fascism that everyone, including me, cites, but that's another video. Anyway, Echo once said, Having an enemy is important not only to define our identity, but also to provide us with an obstacle against which to measure our system of values and in seeking to overcome, to demonstrate our own worth. We are concerned here not so much with the almost natural phenomenon of identifying an enemy who's threatening us, but with the process of creating and demonizing the enemy. That passage came from a lecture called Inventing the Enemy, and it's a long collection of citations where a figure not only names an enemy, but creates a portrait of the enemy. Invariably, an ugly portrait. The thing I like about Echo, he cites his sources. For example, he cites Cicero's orations against Catiline, a man whom he accused of plotting to overthrow the Roman Senate. Cicero described his political enemy as keeping the company of people who spend their time feasting in the arms of loose women, torpid with wine, sated with food, crowned with wreaths, oiled with unguents, weakened by copulation, belch out in words that all good citizens must be killed and the city must be set on fire. Echo also cites the Roman historian Tacitus, who said of the Jewish people, All things that are sacred for us are profane for them, and what is impure for us is lawful for them. Echo cites another passage. See if you can guess what this is from. Vices the most notorious seem to be the portion of this unhappy race. Idleness, treachery, revenge, cruelty, impudence, stealing, lying, profanity, debauchery, nastiness, and intemperance are said to have extinguished the principles of natural law and to have silenced the reproofs of conscience. They are strangers to every sentiment of compassion and are an awful example of the corruption of man when left to himself. You know what that's from? It's the Encyclopedia. Specifically, the first encyclopedia published in the United States in 1798. And it's from the entry on November Echo Golf Romeo Oscar. Nobody ever saw a bug come to the aid of another because it was wounded. They cooperate perfectly in fighting, but units are abandoned the instant they are no longer useful. Our behavior is different. How often have you seen a headline like this? Two die attempting rescue of a drowning child. If a man gets lost in the mountains, hundreds will search and often two or three searches are killed. But the next time somebody gets lost, just as many volunteers turn out. Poor arithmetic. Very human. It runs through all our folklore, all human religions, all our literature, our racial conviction, that when one human needs rescue, others should not count the price. Weakness? It might be the unique strength that wins us a galaxy. Weakness or strength? Bugs don't have it. In all of these examples, the narcissism of minor differences isn't just physical, but moral. They can't just be different, they must also be wicked. And any difference, no matter how minor, can be made major. 
It's like another author said, by the data to date, there is only one animal in the galaxy dangerous to man, man himself. So he must supply his own indispensable competition. He has no enemy to help him. That author, Robert Anson Heinlein, from the notebooks of Lazarus Long. Once that moral difference is established, dehumanization is easy. Because of our evolutionary history, it's most convenient to liken our enemies to animals, non-humans, apes, if they're useful, insects, if they're in the way. Did you know that Zyklone B was commercially marketed pesticide? Sometimes this Manichaeism goes to its logical conclusion and dehumanizes the neighbor. Or to speak plainly, it turns him into an animal. In fact, the terms the settler uses when he mentions the native are zoological terms. He speaks of the yellow man's reptilian motions, of the stink of the native quarter, of breeding swarms, of foulness, of spawn, of gesticulations. When the settler seeks to describe the native fully in exact terms, he constantly refers to the bestiary. Franz Fanon, the wretched of the earth. Even though Fanon writes of the relationship between colonizers and the colonized, don't get the idea that such language is restricted to those of European imperialists. Brush up on your Kenya Rwanda and learn this word, Inyanzi. In the early 90s, it's what the ruling Hutu regime called the rebel Tutsi people. The word was used by politicians, by the radio, and by this magazine, Kangura which ran this editorial in March 1993. An Inyenzi cannot give birth to a butterfly. It is true. An Inyenzi gives birth to another Inyenzi. The history of Rwanda shows us clearly that a Tutsi stays always the same, that he has never changed. The malice, the evil are just as we knew them in the history of our country. We are not wrong in saying that an Inyenzi gives birth to another Inyenzi. For some reason, if you plug Inyenzi into Google Translate, you get moth, which is strange. Every other source I found will translate it to cockroach. One of the most popular science fiction series today, Black Mirror, did an episode that explicitly responds to Heinlein, military setting about a soldier fighting bugs. Except he's not fighting bugs. Your army implants, they put it in your head to help you fight, and when it works, you see us as something other. He discovers that his ocular implants are only making him see bugs, instead of the innocent people he's really killing. But I've seen roaches. They're like, uh... Animals? The monsters, I've seen them. The implants made you see this. Black Mirror is not subtle, but we live in unsubtle times. You have times. to take out their families. It's how you justify a genocide. You make the enemy into something so detestable, you can't stand their existence. It's how you can make killing them into a routine. We learned not to waste ammo even on warriors except in self-protection. Instead, we went after their lairs. Find a hole, drop down at first a gas bomb which explodes gently a few seconds later, releasing an oily liquid which evaporates as a nerve gas tailored to bugs, it is harmless to us, and which is heavier than air and keeps on going down. Then you use a second grenade of HE to seal a hole. We still don't know whether we were getting deep enough to kill the queens, but we did know that the bugs didn't like these tactics. Our intelligence through the skinnies and back onto the bugs themselves was definite on this point. Besides, we cleaned their colony off Shoal completely this way. Maybe they managed to evacuate the queens and the brains, but at least we were learning to hurt them. But so far as the roughnecks were concerned, these gas bombings were simply another drill. To be done according to orders, by the numbers, on the bounce. Uh oh. I'm sorry. Was that your auntie? Oh, then that must mean that that's your uncle then, huh? Ain't much to look at after you scrape him off your boot. Forgive me if my dissection of bigotry is super obvious to some people. I'm assuming that the people who are really, really into Starship Troopers unironically 
need to be told how obvious the metaphor is. That was an arrogant thing to say. Yes, I am privileged. Yes, my family is privileged. But we were still foreigners in another country. We had our own neighborhoods and special shops where we could get our own goods from home. And we realized that we lived in a country that was not ours. We were guests there. Also, we were servants of the American global military empire, but you know. But I don't know if I ever you know, experienced discrimination, I think. I, I don't think I ever did. I mean, I was in a bubble. I was in this bubble of Americana, sort of, kind of. Have you ever felt othered for being an American? Oh, sure. And I was coming out of the Albert Heim, and I was chatting with someone, and this little old lady was getting ready to get on her bicycle, and if, if you can imagine, she was wearing her nice skirt and heels, and she may have had a hat on, you know, how certain generation of Dutch women were, mm -hmm. and gave us a dirty look and, and said, why aren't you speaking Dutch? Yeah. <laughs> we were probably blocking your way, you know, to be honest. But. but because our histories were shared, because our languages were similar, we had it easier than some people's families who'd been there for decades longer than we had. And of course, we were white. Yeah, the Dutch national narrative is one of tolerance and all, but their empire, like America, was built on the slave trade. Their classic art is filled with middle-class people trying on exotic foreign goods plundered from their colonies, and, oh yeah, every Dutch Christmas is celebrated with mass ritual blackface. Zwarte Piet, Black Piet, just sucks so much. So, so much. It's not just that he's a quote-unquote helper. It's not just that he kidnaps naughty kids in his sack. It's not just that we're being both gaslit and retconned with narratives saying that he's just that color because of soot from the chimneys he goes down. It's that he's supposed to be a moor. Sinterklaas, in folklore, comes from not the North Pole, but Spain. And his servants aren't just dark-skinned. A secondary implication is that they are converted, or captured, Moorish Muslims. A population which Europe, over the last two decades and beyond, have become increasingly hostile towards. After you left, and shortly after I left, the Dutch really started having to deal with uh, racism in their society, particularly with a large influx of Moroccan and Indonesian immigrants. That's not actually true. But the national narrative we were being fed made us think they were. Most people in the Netherlands of Turkish or Moroccan descent came through a guest worker program in the 1960s. And that's not even including people from Indonesia and Suriname who had emigrated from the former Dutch colonies in that same time period. Actually, you want to hear a joke that I heard in, I think it was 2004, soon after um, Theo van Gogh was killed um, by an a assassin. child. Yeah, an assassin. Uh, some guy from Morocco. He was Moroccan. Yeah, because if memory serves, Theo van Gogh was a right-wing politician who railed against immigrants. No, no, no. He was not a politician. He was a filmmaker. He was a filmmaker who made a film depicting the backs of women with the Quran, verses of the Quran superimposed on them, and basically trying to paint Islam itself as a fundamentally misogynist institution. Like, this is what they will do to your women. Do so, you know, tolerant understanding. The joke that I heard goes like this. Skunk and a rabbit, babies, they have no idea who they are, what they are, and they see each other. And the skunk says to the rabbit, hey, what are you? Um, I don't know. Well, let me look at you. You have big, long ears, a white, fluffy tail. You must be a rabbit. And the rabbit says to the skunk, well, you're not entirely black. You're not entirely white. You smell really bad. You must be a Turk. Uh, yep. <sighs> I heard that joke in senior year of high school. It was told by another student. I'm pretty sure he was Dutch. After the murder of the filmmaker, Dutch culture became increasingly more Islamophobic. People started complaining about needing new translators in Turkish or Arabic, which seems like an odd thing to complain about. All educated Dutch children were being taught French and German and English. Would it be too much to ask of Dutch schools to include courses in Turkish and Arabic? I mean, they're just languages like any other. 
right? But of course, that's not the goal. The goal is to create an enemy to rally around. The Muslim extremism. I had left our home outside of The Hague before the founding of the Partei voor Vrijheid, founded by Geert Wilders, a man who compared the Quran to Mein Kampf and campaigned on a platform of restricting immigration laws. He is noted for his shock of dyed blonde hair. I mean, Geert Wilders, they, they basically elected the neo-Nazi, the parliament. Uh, oh no, oh no, what could, what could that be like? And I always tell my American friends, if you let um, Islam being seeded on your soil, don't be surprised that you will harvest Sharia law. But, uh, they're not necessarily more progressive. Things just happen sooner there. So you may have asked yourself, but wait, Kyle, you said you lived by the Hague. Isn't that where they... Yes. Yes, the Hague is world famous for its international criminal court. In fact, I have a very vivid memory of it. When we would drive to downtown Scheveningen to watch imported Hollywood blockbusters, we would always take von Alkamadalan and pass the United Nations detention unit. Do you remember that we used, we would drive by the jail where Slobodan Milosevic was? Hi, Slobo. Yeah. Hi, Slobo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we would joke about that. Yeah. Slobodan Milosevic, who was kept in a detention center on our route downtown, is a pretty good example of a fascist who used other people's fascism as a way to expand his own brand of fascism. Sorry. Nationalism. The rise of Serbian nationalism is a fascinating case study. Using their own historical victimization to victimize others, they oppressed Muslims, justifying themselves by citing their rule by the Ottoman Empire. They oppressed Croats, justifying themselves by citing the genocide of Serbs under the Ustashi regime. The narcissism of minor differences allowed the people of the Balkans to expand those differences until the difference meant death. Of course, racist jokes and so on can be extremely oppressive, humiliating, and so on. Slavoj Žižek, a Slovenian, often tells dirty jokes about his fellow former Yugoslavs. A fairy comes to a Slovene farmer and asks him, I will do whatever you want to you, just remember, I will do to your neighbor twice as much. No? You know what is Slovene farmer's answer? Take one of my eyes. <laughs> Saying that these old jokes were a form of inclusivity. To create an atmosphere or to practice these jokes in such a way that they really function as that little bit of obscene contact which establishes true proximity between us. So of course he's on record saying this. I was signing a book of mine. Two black guys and they asked me to sign a book and seeing them there, I couldn't resist the worst racist remark. When I was returning the books to them, I told them, you know, now I don't know which one is for whom, you know, you blacks like yellow guys, you look all the same. They embraced me and they told me, you can call me You know, when they tell you this, it means we are really close. He is the Elvis of philosophy. Those ethnic resentments had boiled under Tito, and in the 90s, free from oversight and without having to pretend to like their neighbors, that cancer called nationalism flared. During the war of the breakup of Yugoslavia, Serbian propaganda told anti-Croat and anti-Muslim lies. Camps devoted to the systemic of women, men, girls, and boys were created, all designed to destroy every element of the culture. And it so happened, that a Dutch battalion, under the command of the United Nations, was ordered to protect the small town of Srebrenica, which was declared a safe zone by the UN in 1993. The force, nicknamed Dutch Bat, held the area for as long as they could, despite poor supply flow from the Dutch government. In 1995, Serbian forces, under General Ratko Mladic, overwhelmed the Dutch, and Srebrenica fell. Girls and women were systemically raped and men and boys were separated and killed. Estimates range from six to 8,000 were killed at Srebrenica in Bosnia. And in Kosovo, they were planning to do it again to ethnic Albanians. Their justification being that Albanian birth rates were higher than the Serbs. They politicized giving birth. And it could have been worse had NATO forces not begun a bombing campaign that would cripple the Serbian army 
and would lead to the eventual arrest of Milosevic and Mladic and their detention and trial. If you'll recall, my father first started working for NATO in 1998, the same year that NATO orchestrated its bombing campaign against Serbia. Longtime viewers of my show may remember an old movie review of mine. Serbia. Yes. In 2011, I made a review of a movie called A Serbian Film, a horror movie that became briefly infamous on the internet because of its incredibly graphic content. I'm not going to recap the plot, just read the Wikipedia summary. Right? As a film, it's not very good. But I can't deny that it is a genuine attempt to grapple with the legacy of policies of ethnic cleansing and sexual violence by Serbian nationalists, though through exaggeration. Although, comparing the events in this film to the actual atrocities committed during the Bosnian War, they were not exaggerating by much. But anyway, I ended the review with this joke. GET. ME. NATO. You have reached the headquarters of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in Brussels. Sir, I command that you do everything in your power to wipe Serbia off the map. I think that joke was my way of processing a lot of complicated emotions I'd had since seventh grade. Dad, I should tell you a story. Um, Go ahead. In seventh grade, some kid some kid, we were in social studies class learning about, um, about genocides around the world because that's what our school curriculum had. Um, yeah. I mentioned that my dad worked in NATO and he said, ha ha, your dad's bombing Serbians. Um, I was not. NATO certainly was. NATO uh, with US urging and this is when Wesley Clark, I believe, was the uh, uh, Supreme Allied Commander. One of those dual hat jobs that, that has still kept ever since Dwight Eisenhower. You know, once NATO was formed, you know, that job became a dual hat job, Supreme Allied Commander, Europe. No, I wasn't. This is why I say I was far, far removed. But clearly, there was U.S. policy. Uh, there was NATO policy endorsed by the UN, although once the orders come through to uh, kind of uh, encourage uh, uh, the use of force or to allow the use of force, uh, the rules of engagement, quite often people don't want to know about the rules of engagement. At that point in time, the US and NATO uh, uh, bombing campaign uh, at the time, uh, they were going after uh, bridges and they were going after uh, any number of things that were part of the uh, Serbian infrastructure. Now, was it all Serbian military infrastructure? Arguably not. If you've got a bridge in a city that uh, allows traffic to go to a local uh, Serbian command and control station, uh, it's also serving the rest of the city. So a lot of things bad there. And I think you can research this, but I think this is also the time where the U.S. Uh, had a uh, uh, we bombed a Chinese embassy or a Chinese consulate. Uh, and in, in Serbia? Yeah. Much sturm und drang and people were saying, well, we screwed up and then arguing, well, you know, maybe we didn't screw up and, and we, had a we had a reason to take it out and then apologize profusely afterwards as if we did it by accident. Uh, it happened. So your, your, your friend uh, or your classmate who said your dad, uh, you know, is bombing Serbia. Yeah, that was happening with NATO. What I tell myself about my involvement with, with, with the military, um, it is better to have good communications with all of your forces uh, so that you can keep them under control, so that you can give them good information so that they don't do anything stupid and so that they can stay safe. Uh, and if you want to know the 
the unifying theme of what I did in the 45 years or so that I was working as an engineer, and I guess still as an engineer. It, it's, it's all been on communications, control, and, and, and understanding. I asked my dad if he's okay with saying all this and putting it in the video because, hell, this is a matter of public record. It, it happened. It happened. And for me, my defense, I tried to make myself the butt of the joke. That out of all the horrors the people of the Balkans had gone through, I was most mad at a film that actually tried to process those horrors in a way that was, well, horrifying. And I'm well aware of how admitting this looks. But when I was a kid, honestly, it felt like, it felt like a success. Europe had yet another nationalist bastard trying to ethnically cleanse his country. I was a stupid American. I didn't know the difference between a Serb and a Croat and Albanian, but I still knew a fascist when I saw one. Hi, Slobo. I can't believe I wrote this line in 2011. The promise of a happy life wrapped up in a fairy tale about making the Serbian nation great again. Making the Serbian nation great. The Milosevic regime was full of bad people. They did bad things, and if we hadn't intervened, it would have been worse. They would have done so many worse things. Another Srebrenica. Another Auschwitz. Of course, that was before we tried to do the same thing in Iraq. Told ourselves we were toppling a dictator, making him pay for his crimes against humanity. Before we opened a vacuum and let ISIS grow in his absence. But this was before that. Hussein, of course, never went to The Hague. And even Milosevic never saw justice. He died before a sentence was passed. Rotko Mladic had a verdict passed in 2017, but even he's still being tried after an appeal was filed. I don't know if justice will ever actually be served. And the Dutch, to their credit, took responsibility for their role in the massacre. Prime Minister Wim Kok resigned in 2002 after being criticized by the NIOD Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies for failing to prevent the genocide. In 2015, a Dutch court found the Dutch government liable for at least 300 of the deaths at Srebrenica, but not the other 7,000. At least they got a trial. At least they were subject to law. Yeah, at the very least. It gave me comfort that there's a place where war criminals could go that there's a legislative body intact that could hold dictators accountable, that even demagogues and genocide enablers could face justice, that an international force can bring justice to nationalist crimes. It was comforting. I have so many memories of that part of The Hague. My prom was there. I was 17, I think, when my IB European history teacher told me how easy it would be for Americans to take it. How one could, under cover of night, land on that pier and go through the city and extract any American national being held in the detention center for war crimes, which the US could do, and in fact had put into law. The American Service Members Protection Act passed in the House of Representatives in May of 2002. Passed to the Senate in June, signed into law by George W. Bush that August. Section 2008. Authority to free members of the armed forces of the United States and certain other persons detained or imprisoned by or on behalf of the International Criminal Court. Authority. The President is authorized to use all means necessary and appropriate to bring about the release of any person described in subsection B who is being detained or imprisoned by, on behalf of, or at the request of, the International Criminal Court. Did you catch that military euphemism? All means necessary and appropriate. I think most people know something about America doing something to stop U.S. war criminals from being dried at The Hague. I don't know how many know it was done through the threat of military action. They don't even have to say, we will invade. They just have to let the Dutch know that they've thought about it. 
that threat. The U.S. Armed Forces, with the authority to act with a necessity and appropriateness determined solely by the U.S. President, brought down upon this city should any non-American bring justice to an American war criminal, of which we have many. Some are even still in power. It's haunted me for years. But it's only in the last four years that I, as so many other people around the world have realized before me, the true horror of that threat. How America has their laws and their guns on their side to accuse themselves of consequences should they ever be subject to the same laws as any other nation. Another bug hunt, boys. This one is a little different, as you know. Since they still hold prisoners of ours, we can't use a Nova Bomb on Clandathu, so this time we go down, stand on it, hold it, and take it away from them. The boat will be down to retrieve us. Instead, it'll fetch more ammo and rations. If you're taken prisoner, keep your chin up and follow the rules. Because you've got the whole outfit behind you. You've got the whole Federation behind you. We'll come and get you. All that force in Den Haag, in... Scheveningen. How is my pronunciation? A man for all seasons. I can't quote the speech from it, but I truly believe the speech that Thomas More gives. Now you'd give the devil benefit of law. Yes, what would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil? Yes, I'd cut down every law in England to do that. Oh? And when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper, the laws all being flat? This country is planted thick with laws from coast to coast, man's yeah, laws, not God's. And if you cut them down and you're just a man, do, report. do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes. I'd give the devil benefit of law for my own safety's sake. I truly believe in that speech, too. I just wish we'd actually followed it when we still could. I've had a long time to ponder how to recognize fascism, especially how to recognize it in translation. I mean, if Echo is right and we need enemies to create a sense of self, I choose to make my enemy that which makes enemies. Now, I'll say that my family is made up of lifelong liberals. Anti-Trump, before him, anti-Bush. They're not QAnon, they aren't COVID deniers. They are as anti-fascist as I am. They've never considered Trump to be anything less than a fascist. Yet I couldn't bring myself to call Heinlein a fascist to their face. Uh, or at least I tiptoed around it. I could easily see how it could be read as fascist, given the language and what the arguments are being made towards, like the goals behind them. I could see how a someone with a fascist mindset... <laughs> Hi, Kitty. This is totally going in the video. Yeah. We talked about the veterans, how they took control and imposed the stability that has lasted for generations since. The first fascists, the fasci de combattimento, the first people to call themselves fascists, they were Italian veterans. Soldiers who'd been used by their nation, then discarded. And so they imagined a life where their glory in death was paramount. Not their life, but in their glorious death. The death, of course, is never glorious. It's sad and ugly and it's corona perverse to find any sort of beauty in it. But they were veterans. They were trained. It was what they knew how to do. And their battlefield talents were put to use in peacetime, enlisted in a new thing, the squadrismo, and they made themselves useful once again, primarily by breaking up workers' unions. The practical reason for continuing our system is the same as the practical reason for continuing anything. It works satisfactorily. I don't know if Heinlein intentionally wrote his origin to mirror the rise of Italian fascism, though it certainly maps onto it well. And I'm not sure if he believed anything he wrote in this novel. With a body of work as vast as his, with so many outlandish ideas entertained, with it all delivered in the assured prose of a preacher, there's bound to be something he wouldn't stand by later in his life. But that's the problem with authors. 
never really does matter what they say. Authors die. Words live on. And their fans end up doing the fighting. I don't think Heinlein was a fascist, but I also don't think it matters that he was one. But at the same time, I don't think Verhoeven is an anti-fascist. I mean, if he was one, the most anti-fascist thing he could have done was not make this movie at all. Not give people the imagery and the language and the spirit, even if it was satire. Because what he did was write a world where a man is taught how to fight and kill everything that he is not and devote his mortal life to everything that he is with plenty of detail on what he is and is not. Everyone is a hero. The population is selective. The weak are held in contempt. Check your echo. Let me tell you something. I'm from Buenos Aires, and I say kill them all! Yeah! Okay. I've had a long time to ponder the word immigrant. I wondered if I was one, or if I was simply that term that privileged Americans use to call themselves abroad. Expats. I'm an expat. Maybe I am an expat. Maybe I'm a child of an empire. My family was sent abroad to serve the interests of the United States as part of an international military alliance founded to stop the spread of Soviet communism, which may be part of why I've had trouble fitting in with the rest of left tube. No one in my immediate family is enlisted, yet the vast mechanisms of American military culture have permeated our entire lives. And yet when I moved back to the US for college, Back to the same town where I, for the most part, had grown up until I was 11. I was strange to most people. I was told that my accent was weird, that my way of speaking was weird. And I wondered what made me seem so foreign. I wondered how strange my behavior was, what might have given me away as someone who ain't from round these parts. You know, no one called me pretentious until I came back to the States. I always wondered if I was too direct for Americans. Too left for Americans. Too quiet for Americans. Too queer for Americans. Too European for Americans. Because even when I was young, I could tell that the definition of an American when I left was very, very different than the definition of an American when I came back. And in these last four years, the shores of the Atlantic have never, ever felt wider. So I can understand why a foreign man who grew up under the boot of the Axis and the bombs of the Allies might be wary of the story of a boy made into a warrior. America and the Netherlands have had 400 years of history together. Even when I lived there, I never felt that far from home. America was still there. America was everywhere. And even Verhoeven, a Dutch man, a man whose roots should theoretically be as similar to Americans as possible, if even he seems too foreign, <sighs> then what hope could any foreigner ever have? Any foreigner in this country, in America. Maybe an immigrant is just someone from another place. Someone with their own beliefs, their own childhood, their own assumptions about the way the world should be. We should value immigrants because they may see a better truth about ourselves than we can ever see. Paul Verhoeven was an immigrant in Hollywood, one of many in Hollywood's long history. People who came from afar, worked in the gigantic dream factory, and showed some new ways to see the world. Remember, everyone is alien to someone. Even you. Who would give you an ugly picture and say, this is you? Who would look at you and see a bug? You many, no many Europeans, people, most of whom have no people. European roots, have been forced to ponder this question harder than others. <laughs> Because by fate or by history, they have found themselves strangers in strange lands. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. 
They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. He ran against immigrants. It was that simple for me. That's how I knew he was a fascist. That's my shibboleth. And it has baffled me for years that that wasn't enough for everyone in this country to recognize him as a fascist. And every day I am reminded that the United States of America is a foreign country. Stomach corona made a concert clothes sucking. And as for Starship Troopers, this story, this book that has given inspiration to my brother and my father and the men that my mother grew up with, given the way that I was raised, how could I possibly not see it as fascist? Remember, NATO bombed Milosevic over an alleged plan to ethnically cleanse Kosovo of Albanians, a plan that began with propaganda about high Albanian birth rates. Briefly, thus, all wars arise from population pressure. Yes, even the Crusades, though you have to dig through trade routes and birth rate and several other things to prove it. Morals. All correct moral rules derive from the instinct to survive. Moral behavior is survival behavior above the individual level, as in a father who dies to save his children. But since population pressure results from the process of surviving through others, then war, because it results from population pressure, derives from the same inherited instinct which produces all moral rules suitable for human beings. Check of proof. Is it possible to abolish war by relieving population pressure and thus do away with the all too evident evils of war through constructing a moral code under which population is limited to resources? Without debating the usefulness or morality of Planned Parenthood, it may be verified by observation that any breed which stops its own increase gets crowded out by breeds which expand. Some human populations did so in Terran history, and other breeds moved in and engulfed them. Nevertheless, let's assume that the human race manages to balance birth and death just right to fit its own planets and thereby becomes peaceful. Soon, about next Wednesday, the bugs move in. Kill off this breed which ain't a study war no more, and the universe forgets us. Which may still happen. Either we spread and wipe out the bugs, or they spread and wipe us out. Because both races are tough and smart and want the same real estate. Do you know how fast population pressure could cause us to build an entire universe shoulder to shoulder? The answer will astound you. Just the flicker of an eye in terms of the age of a race. Try it. It's a compound interest expansion. But does man have any light to spread through the universe? Man is what he is, a wild animal with the will to survive, and so far, the ability against all competition. Unless one accepts that, anything one says about morals, war, politics, you name it, is nonsense. Correct morals arise from knowing what man is, not what do-gooders and well-meaning old Aunt Nellies would like him to be. The universe will let us know, later, whether or not man has any right to expand and they just reached the capital again. In the meantime, the MI will be in there, on the bounce and swing on the side of our own race. One day, someone like me is gonna kill you and your whole fucking race. After I read your book! I'm trying to, like, cite my sources. I'm trying to, um, be specific about the references I make. Yeah. I That's read your book! Yeah. <laughs> Rommel, you son of a bitch. Yeah, I, want to look, your book. I want to look my audience in the eye and say, I read your book. Father, mother, brother, I read your book. And I am terrified of those who may read it and take from it a very, very different lesson than you have. I love you all. Let's talk about heroes. Here's a story, familiar to most Americans, 
John Henry, the steel driving man, born with a hammer in his hand, was the strongest man working on the railroad. His captain set up a race between John Henry and a steam-powered drilling machine, and mighty John Henry beat that steam drill, beat that steam drill down. Though his great heart couldn't take the stress. And so, John Henry died, hammer in his hand. Legends of Henry first sprang up in the 19th century. Several places in the U.S. claimed to be the site of the contest, including Georgia, Alabama, and Virginia. The story is about a black man who works himself to death. I'll let you connect the dots. Here's another story of a hero. In the Netherlands, outside of Harlem, a boy walked by a dike and saw water spurting out of it. The boy, being a good little boy, who knows that any leak in the dike would spell doom for Holland, put his finger in the hole. And he waited and waited and waited until the people of the town came and saved him. One wonders if the people of Harlem never came. The boy would likely stay there until he died, becoming a permanent fixture of the dike. But as it turns out, that story about the little Dutch boy isn't Dutch. It's American. It's from the novel Hans Brinker, written by an American in 1865. From Russell Shorto's Amsterdam, a history of the world's most liberal city. Freer because you're not alone. That is the story that Amsterdam tells. Working together, we win land from the sea. Individually, we own it. Individually, we prosper so that collectively we do. Together, we maintain society of individuals. For an American raised on a diet of raw individualism, you know, <laughs> The government's doing this? How dare they? You know, that Take sort of it. thing. For an American raised on a diet of raw individualism, it remains a bit of a challenge to parse that logic. Another Dutch friend, who happens to be an expert on water management, drove home the deferring sensibilities when he told me that the fable of Hans Brinker, the little Dutch boy who sticks his finger in the leaking dike to save the dirty city and is rewarded for his heroism, is completely incomprehensible to the Dutch themselves. Carving their city out of the effluvial medieval muck necessitated a high level of cooperation among individuals, a communal sensibility that is evident today in the social welfare system. This is why, according to my friend, the fable doesn't work for the Dutch. The heroism of the story, he said, is purely American. Dyke building and dyke repair are communal enterprises. Were the Dutch to construct such a fairy tale, the hero would probably be the town water board. Hans Brinker was not the dyke story. Unless I'm confused. Hans Brinker was a story about silver skates and the, the um, 11 city skate. Those two fables are from the same book, though. They're from the okay. same novel. Hans Brinker, the character in the story, is told this fable about a boy um, who sticks his finger in the dike. And, um... Okay, so I'm, I'm not wrong. Point is, both stories are about people who make the noble sacrifice to put their own bodies between loved ones and desolation. Both John Henry and Hans Brinker are stories about people dying to work. And they're both American. Heather shows the priorities, doesn't it? The noblest fate that a man can endure is to place his own mortal body between his loved home and the war's desolation. The In one of his later, less acclaimed novels, The Number of the Beast, Heinlein wrote about fantasies. He imagined another polycule of brilliant people on adventures on the stars, but his twist was they could go to other realities. The number of the beast in this story was not 666, but 6 to the 6th power to the 6th power, for that is the number of realities that exist. And those realities are the fictions of our world. It, it, it's reality shifting. I mean, it, that TikTok thing the kids are doing, like it's reality shifting. Your it's TikTok reality shifting written reality. in the 80s. Heinlein's premise for the world as myth is basically that all fictional worlds are equally real as reality. Under a form of pantheistic solipsism, our fictions are merely a different kind of real. And we are all authors of a new reality. It's not a very good book. It has a lot of the same feel as unpublished crossover fan fiction. Also, it's amazingly sexist. Like, even for Heinlein, like, there's this whole passage that I refuse to speak out loud, but he Heinlein thinks that women's nipples are indicators of their mood, like the ears on a kitty cat. You can tell a woman's mood by looking at her nipple. What? Men, 
Everyone has nipples! You should know this, dude! But there is some truth to it. Our fantasies can feel more real than the long-dead authors who told them to us. If you read it correctly, it's all in the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Could anyone ask for a plainer statement of the self-evident fact that nothing exists until someone imagines it, and thereby gives it being? Reality. The distinction lies only in the difference between being and becoming, a distinction that cancels out when any figment fact is examined from different ends of the entropy error. Who is more real? Homer or Ulysses? Shakespeare or Hamlet? Burroughs or Tarzan? Corollary. Who is more real? Robert Heinlein or Johnny Rico? And all of these characters, the stories of Ulysses, Hamlet, Tarzan, John Henry, Hans Brinker, Johnny Rico, they are stories told to boys. Boys ready to go on the adventure of life. In some ways, the number of the beast feels like an old man retreating into childhood, taking characters and retelling the pulps of his youth. But also, it might be the Heinlein concept that is most relevant to today. I mean, it's proven daily by the number of people who go online and through posting, through their world building, through, yes, reality shifting, through the magic of the word, create a new reality until it becomes everyone's reality. Call a human being a bug until they become one. And I will say, there is a threat to the traditional Dutch values of liberal tolerance. It's not from Islam. Because even now, in the Netherlands, terrible words, terrible ideas are creeping in from foreign lands. The Dutch are speaking in tongues, rambling incoherent nonsense, strange foreign words like Q Anon. Now, Q Anon is in either geval geen. Quanon is not only American, Quanon is gewoon worldwide. The whole Nederland state and the buitenland state is just one big pedophile network. Eenmaal reguliere media, jullie verraden het volk. Quanon is actually tegen the deep state. Oh, the deep state? Tegen the deep state. Have you in Nederland ook dan the deep state? Uh, wij hebben, uh, ja, die heb je overal. Deeper start is the Dutch. Deep state, what she said, is all American. We live in a time of mass delusions. Authors die. Words live on. And the fans do the fighting. The novel Starship Troopers ends with Rico doing one last drop. He's finally the master of his craft and the leader of his team. Shortly, I was able to report. Bridge, Rico's Roughnecks, ready for drop. 31 seconds, Lieutenant, she added. Good luck, boys. This time we take him. Right, Captain? Check. Now, some music while you wait? She switched it on. To the everlasting glory of the infantry. He doesn't celebrate his citizenship. He never does vote. We don't even know if he lives after this mission. All he does is listen to a song about shouting glory to his fighting unit and keeps fighting. That is the only service he ever performs. He'll just be forever dropping forever fighting, forever serving by making the other guy die faster. The film ends much like the book. They haven't won. They're still fighting. They never get to vote or hold office or have children or live. Their only reward is the chance to keep fighting. They will win. They will. That victory is always in the future. And it will never come, because under fascism, the only true victory is death. And their way of life can't sustain peace. The novel won the Hugo Award, and would go on to influence generations of writers. Perhaps the best known direct response to it was Joe Haldeman's 1974 novel, The Forever War. Haldeman was drafted into the US Army as a combat engineer, and based his story on his experiences fighting in the Vietnam War. The Forever War takes place over a millennium, as soldiers fight an interstellar war dilated by relativity, and fought without purpose, without reason, without care. 
At the end of the book, Haldeman writes, The 1,143-year-long war had begun on false pretenses, and only because the two races were unable to communicate. Once they could talk, the first question was, Why did you start this thing? And the answer was, Me? Haldeman won the Nebula Award for the novel, and Heinlein wrote him a letter praising his work. So it's not like a complete reputation. Perhaps the most in-depth and most vicious critique of Heinlein came from British author Michael Moorcock in a 1977 essay boldly called Starship Stormtroopers. His opening sentences are barnstorming. There are still a few things which bring a naive sense of shocked astonishment to me whenever I experience them. A search service, in which the rituals of Dark Age superstition are performed without any apparent sense of incongruity in the participants. A fat Soviet bureaucrat pontificating about bourgeois decadence. A radical singing the praises of Robert Heinlein. If I were sitting on a tube train, and all the people opposite me were reading Mein Kampf with obvious enjoyment and approval, it probably wouldn't disturb me much more than if they were reading Heinlein, Tolkien, or Richard Adams. If those last two threw you off, consider how Tolkien's habit of dividing his world up by race could be seen as, um, racist. And also how a big chunk of Watership Down involves getting enough females to breed a new rabbit den. That could be construed as slightly, um, blood and soilish. But we're talking about Heinlein as we have been for, oh, whoa, this video is really long. Wow, God, I need a break. Moorcock's essay is scathing, taking aim not only at Heinlein, but at whole swaths of science fiction tropes that built futures only to crudely justify the past. In the final analysis, it is a kind of easygoing militarism favored by the veteran professional soldier. The chain of command is complex. Many adult responsibilities can be left to that chain as long as broad but firmly enforced rules from high up are adhered to. To be a rugged individualist a la Heinlein and others is to be forever a child who must obey, charm, and cajole to be tolerated by some benign, omniscient father. There is, of course, a simple word for this system, and it's not fascism. It is a word which may disturb some viewers if I invoke it. It's an internet shibboleth. In Greek, it means the rule of the Father, Papa Alpha Tango, Romeo India, Alpha Romeo, Charlie Hotel Yankee, Patriarchy. There's a part in the book that didn't make it into the film. The film kills both of Rico's parents in Buenos Aires. Your transmission has been terminated the book only kills the mother. Rico's father ends up enlisting, and in a special moment, they bond not as father and son, but as brothers in arms. I was a corporal when we dropped on Sheol. You were there? So was I. With the sudden warm flood of emotion, I felt closer to my father than I ever had before in my life. Son, I always understood what you were doing better than your mother did. She never had a chance to know, any more than a bird can understand swimming. And perhaps I knew why you did it, even though I begged to doubt that you knew yourself at the time. At least half of my anger at you was sheer resentment. That you had actually done something that I knew, buried deep in my heart, I should have done. I had to perform an act of faith. I had to prove to myself that I was a man, not just a producing, consuming economic animal, but a man. So from this passage, Heinlein didn't think of men as merely producing, consuming economic animals. Which, funnily enough, puts him in the company of a certain I, I older writer. Coming from. So when I confronted my own father on the battlefield... Uh, I'm saying something that, that you're writing down, which is scary. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not writing it down. Honestly, what I'm doing is I'm looking at my phone because um, I actually talked with a friend of mine who actually is a Marxist scholar. Um, okay. From Marx, from the German ideology, he offered this as a counterpoint to a, a human, human being, being should be able to change a diaper, plan a diaper, plan a yeah. butcher a hog, for as soon as the distribution of labor comes into being, each man has a particular exclusive sphere of activity, which is forced upon him and from which he cannot escape. He is a hunter, a fisherman, a herdsman, or a critical critic, and must remain so if he does not want to lose his means of livelihood. While in communist society, ideally, theoretically, where no nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes. 
Society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. Okay, um, just to clarify, uh, cut the chroma key. It sucks anyway. Um, just to clarify, I haven't read that much Marx. Um, I got that quote from my friend John. He actually is a Marxist scholar. Uh, he's the lit crit guy on Twitter and on YouTube. He has a show now. He also does a podcast with his friend Ash um, called The Horror Vanguard, where he talks about horror movies in a critical theory way. It's it's really good. Check it out. I should mention that earlier you described yourself as you know someone who did one thing all his life, that you were an engineer and a special engineer. But Well, yeah, but I mean... I do software, I write papers, I, you know, I, I brief, I educate. Um, trust me, if you're, try if you're trying to sell an idea to somebody. I, I, I'm not trying to sell you an idea. Look, I'm not, I'm not even sure if I believe that Marx quote I said. I just think that maybe we in America need all the options available. I'm not sure if I'm a socialist. I'm not sure if I'm a communist. I, I am just a common, boring liberal. Excuse me, there ain't no such thing as liberals in this country. There's only communists and socialists. You listen to you listen here now. All you watching this stream right here need to know that this man, though he is my brother, is a socialist communist agitator who's come for your guns. And I can't hold this character without throwing up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Curious what your reaction to that is. Um, well, I'm, I'm trying to, that, that, that some, what I was thinking as you were, as you were reading that was I was thinking about the, the uh, medieval European guild system where basically you were allowed to only do one thing and uh, you couldn't get out of that. I, I, get, I guess I've, I've never thought that a Marxist theory would embrace the idea of universal competence as, as their goal. Is well, that I what, is that I, what I, the is framework that, is. Is that what I heard you say? I didn't expect to turn my father into a Marxist by bringing that quote up. I, Truth is, I'm not a Marxist. I don't even know thing one about economics, period. I don't get it, with or without Marxist theory. I'm just some idiot on the internet who just talked about movies because he thought it would, would be fun to do 10 years ago. I, I don't want to debate theory. I don't want to debate political theory online. I, if you came to this video expecting a, a breakdown of the politics of the book. I'm sorry, I can't give you that. I don't want to be part of political YouTube anyway. I don't want to be part of that obnoxious morass of bluster and posturing. And those obnoxious commenters trying to suggest that I didn't understand what fascism means, I've given up on them. Because they gave up on me the second they saw my doughy face and less than macho demeanor. Probably thought I was full of soy or something. Or whatever they're saying now. Now that they're too chicken shit to call me a f to my face! That's why this video goes so long and so deep. Why I spent years writing it. Because I do not want people to think that I don't know what I'm talking about! Online reply men, these culture worries. I you don't want me to prove what I've been through? I've been harassed. I've been with friends as they've gotten harassed. They got death threats. I held my tongue as I got death threats. I held my tongue after I got a comment from a guy saying that he wanted to murder my friends and loved ones in front of me before gouging my eyes out. I think about that message every day. And for what? For not accepting recruitment in whatever f***ing online crusade the white, straight-passing male nerds are going on this week? For not accepting their harassment campaign against women and minorities in comics or gaming or genre movies or whatever the f you're on for not liking your little fucking stories told to boys 
Why did I think this was a good idea? Trying to scare me by posting my address online? <laughs> by posting my family's address online?! Do you know how often I've thought about tracking every single one of those trolls down and just... Giving them some consequences for the f***ing words! <sighs> and thinking that if I did do that, would I finally be the kind of man that they respect? A dominant man. A cruel man. A loud man. A stupid man. Is that really the only kind of man they respect? But I can't talk about that because I know that whatever harassment I've been through, the women I've worked with, the people of color that I've worked with, the LGBT people that I've worked with, they've gotten it 10 times worse. And however hard their pushback against their harassers would have been, mine would have been 10 times harder. All I know is every time I've tried to be a man I'd end up starting fights, pushing people away. Understatement. I've always had too much anger in me. Never talked about it in the video before, but I have always had too much anger in me. It made me think I was broken. Too tough, too wild, too unfit to be with people who could actually live. Not work, not follow orders, but live. And men? Men are too busy proving themselves to be men in order to live. It's just, I've only ever thought that I was fit for being alone in my apartment, making videos on the internet. And even if the breath of life is purchased at birth only through gasping effort and pain, then So that was rough. Het is niet ruw. Het is af. Zijn ze maaien. Maden? So in 2014, um, at the height of a whole harassment campaign against women and minorities in some nerd community, I was doxxed. Or rather, someone in my family was doxxed. Someone who was featured in this video. I'm not going to say who, because I've already revealed a lot about myself in this video. Way more than I ever have in any video. And since 2014, I've been afraid to. I've been afraid to show any part of myself being vulnerable. anything personal. I've been afraid. 
I've been afraid of you, the audience. It's afraid. It's afraid! <laughs> How much more do you all want to know? I wrote this script in a frenzy last year, in just an absolute fury <sighs> at all the things that had been happening in America, at all the things that I knew in my gut would happen in some form or another. And in all this fury and all this research, I had to prove that I understood both the book and the movie. That I grokked it and hawked it. That it was something that I understood to my core. And I knew that I couldn't talk about this movie without addressing a deep wound within me. A deep fracture in my own identity, in my nationality. And I also knew that I couldn't talk about this movie without um, talking to my family about it, because they understood the book so well, and I understood the movie probably better than they did. And we just had to talk about it, and I didn't want them to think that I was <sighs> calling them proto-fascists. If anything, I think I'm calling myself a proto-fascist. That given everything that happened in America between 1998 and 2005, during that time I was living abroad, seeing America from the outside, I've always wondered if I did live in America during that time. Would I have been able to say shibboleth and not just sibboleth the way I had the way I had been saying it when I came back. I mean if I'm proto-fascist then all of America is. Because that's what I'm saying. So this book has been haunting me for a while. By Natasha Leonard, it's called Being Numerous, Essays on non-fascist life. And in her essay, entitled We Anti-Fascists, this passage has really stuck with me, so I'm going to read it to you now. And what of the fascism in each of us who would be anti-fascist? Kill the cop inside your head, goes the anarchist dictum. As philosopher John Pertevi noted in his 2000 essay following Deleuze and Guattari, a thousand independent and self-appointed policemen do not make a Gestapo, though they may be a necessary condition for one. How do we remove ourselves as participants in such a condition? Easier said than done. We cannot simply be anti-fascist. We must also practice and make better habits, forms of life. Rather than as a noun or adjective, anti-fascist as a gerund verb. A constant effort of anti-fascisting against the fascisms that even we ourselves uphold. <sighs> Working to create non-hierarchical ways of living. Working to undo our own privileges and desires for power. The individualized and detached self, the overcoatings of family unit normativity, the authoritarian tendency of careerism, all of them paranoid sites of microfascism in need of anti-fascist care. Again, easier said than done. But better than a faulty approach to anti-fascism that frames it as some pure position which is anything but. We act against fascists in the knowledge we need to act against ourselves too. The strategy is always to create consequences for living a fascist life and seek anti-fascist departures. Easier said than done. I know in the past I've argued with my family about the privileges that we had and how 
anxious I was dealing with it. Even now I think about what structures I've upheld making this very video. I read my sources. I wrote this script. I painted the wall behind me chroma key green. I set up the LED lights. I shot this video. I recorded this sound. I edited this video. I uploaded it to this platform. I have done everything that a human being should be able to do in this ridiculous online video gig that I preposterously label my job. And none of it would have been possible without the toil and labor of people whose names I will never know, whose lives I have the luxury to never consider. Delivery people, mechanics, assembly line workers, patrons, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of taxpayers whose money went to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to give me the education that I would then use to rail against it. I know who I am. So when will I know all those zombies? The most uncontroversial thing that anyone can say about Starship Troopers Starship Troopers is a story told to boys. I mean, it's in the dedication. To Sarge Arthur George Smith, soldier citizen scientist, and to all sergeants anywhere who have labored to make men out of boys. Signed, R.A.H. <sighs> Starship Troopers, the book and the film, is a boy's adventure. It is something told to boys to make them into men. And in these boys' adventures, which have so influenced so much of the culture in so many different facets, as I've tried to prove in this video, we need to question the kind of men we make from boys. And in the 21st century, we will re-explore the notion of what a boy is, and what a man is, what a girl is, what a woman is. We will re-explore the meaning of service and citizenship, work and labor, beyond just the names and lessons of our teachers, our forefathers. Role models can be very important to a boy. I've always believed that we are bound by our fantasies. For a fascist, it seems like the only fantasies they have are ones that end in a beautiful, meaningful death. Is it so unthinkable to imagine a beautiful, meaningful life? Okay, okay, I get a kick out of it. You see, the truly insidious thing about all forms of fascism is that it draws a box around the truth, tells you to focus on that, and says there's nothing outside of it. Nothing. That there are no alternatives. To the point where you can't even imagine saying anything against it. And in America, it seems like we suffer from a lack of imagination. We don't have the words for it. And maybe someone from another place might have the words for it. If only we let them in. This is a story that I've been meaning to bring up. When I was in Holland getting um, driver's training. Yeah. There's a moment um, when I got in the car, first thing I did was lock the door. And yeah. my driving instructor asked me, why'd you do that? Like, he was like really shocked that I did that. Well, I just said, well, I don't know. Like, what if someone tries to steal the car? Like, uh, let's just make it harder for them to like, get in the car. He says, what if you're in an accident? It'll be harder for them to get you out of the car. Yeah. How do I stop seeing myself as either a trooper or a bug? How do I stop seeing everyone else as either a trooper or a bug? How can I imagine a world so different from the one that I've lived in? 
dat is het moeilijke in deze tijd. Ideale, dromen. Mooie verwachtingen komen nog niet bij ons. Hop of ze worden door de gruwelijke werkelijkheid getroffen en zo. Totaal verwoest. Het is een grote wonder dat ik niet al mijn verwachtingen heb opgegeven. Want ze lijken absurd en onuitvoerbaar. Toch houd ik ze vast, ondanks alles. Omdat ik nog steeds aan de innerlijke goedheid van een mens geloof. Het is mij ten een en male onmogelijk alles op te bouwen op de basis van dood, ellende en bewaring. Ik zie hoe de wereld langzaam steeds meer in een woestijn herschapen wordt. Ik hoor steeds harder de aanrollende donder die ook ons zal doden. Ik voel het leed van miljoenen mensen mee en toch, als ik naar de hemel kijk, denk ik, dat alles zich weer ten goede zal wenden. Dat ook deze hardheid zal ophouden. Dat er weer rust en vrede in de wereldorde zal komen. Intussen moet ik mijn denkbeelden hoog en droog houden. In de tijden die komen zijn ze misschien toch nog oud te worden. The world is myth. The most heroic thing anyone can do is imagine a better one. Better than this. Come on, you ape! You wanna live forever! Yes! Because I would like to know more! Here's a good kitty. <laughs> hey, Charlie. <laughs> She doesn't look too thrilled. No, but this is this is the cuddle tax. Oh. What have we done to the mighty <laughs> saber tooth tiger? Yeah, it's a cuddle tax. <laughs> oh, it's um, been fun. This has I'm been glad fun. It's been fun. I'm glad it's been fun. And uh, I, I'm I'm deadly serious. We should do it more often, just just for the fun of it. But. Uh, this video is made possible by my patrons, whose names you should see scrolling by here. I couldn't do this without you. I'm going to take a long break after this video, but if you've watched this far, leave a rose emoji in your comment. If you know what it means, you know what it means. Life to not fascism. Tell me, Captain Strange, do you feel my devotion? Or are you like a droid devoid of emotion? Encounters one and two are not enough for me. What my soul needs is close encounter three. I lost my heart to a starship trooper. Flashing lights in hyperspace. Fighting for the Federation Hand in hand we'll conquer space Listen Captain Strange, what's our destination? The scanners seem to indicate a small deviation Static on the comm, it's Starfleet Command Requesting your position, it's their final demand. Your intentions are known, they found out at last. So if you're going to take me, please make it fast. Touch me, feel me, do what you will. I want to feel that galactic thrill. I lost my heart. To a starship trooper Flashing lights in hyperspace Fighting for the Federation Hand in hand we'll conquer space Katie, I lost my uh, heart zero, to a starship zero. trooper Flashing lights in hyperspace Fighting for the Federation Hand in hand, we'll conquer space. 
face. I lost my heart to a star ship trooper. Flashing lights in hyperspace. Fighting for the Federation. Hand in hand, do you copy? Do you copy? Do you copy?